You're listening to the Orchestra Teacher Podcast. Welcome to the Orchestra Teacher Podcast. This is Dr. Charles Laux, and I am here with an amazing guest, uh, our current ASTA president and uh, an everything person in the string world, uh, Dr. Rebecca McLeod. Welcome to the Orchestra Teacher Podcast, uh, Dr. McLeod. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here with you. Yeah, nice to be here uh, with you. And uh, Dr. McLeod is professor of music education at uh, UNC, that's the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. And you've been there for how long now? Um, you have to think about it. <laughs> I know. I've been there since 2006. And I was going to say I completed my 18th year this year, but maybe it was my 17th year. So, but long enough to pause and try to count the years. That's so, right. Well, good job. Uh, done amazing things there. Um, research awards and awesome teaching, working with youth and putting out some amazing graduates and all those yeah, things. Thanks. All I those appreciate things. that. Yeah. But you, sometimes people ask, I have a hard time when people ask me, probably most of us do, to be honest, most of us that are kind of in the collegiate, but you know, somebody says to me, like, if I'm on an airplane, like, what is your job? And I, which one? I'm always <laughs> trying to figure out what of the hats I wear, am I going to try to say in one, you know, sometimes yeah. I just say I'm a music teacher, uh, because maybe that's the, the best, uh, for the, for the general public, you say I'm a music teacher or music professor, then they get it. No, but, I'm, not, yeah. I'm an orchestra conductor. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a violin player. Yeah. I'm a researcher. I'm an author. Um, I'm a clinician. So yeah, I, I, I often yeah. find myself and, and on occasion, my husband's with me and he says, why did you just tell that person that you teach little kids? I said, well, because I do in my community partnership, I That's teach right. little kids. He's like, you're a college teacher. I said, well, I, I know, but among the things I do, that's what came out of my mouth in that moment. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, um, the, the, as a college professor, there's a lot of hats that yeah, you wear, that's right. you know, especially in, in music. I don't know if the English professor can say the same thing, but yeah, I don't um, know. Yeah. I don't know either, but I think in particular in string education, because, um, we, we are such hybrids. Mm -hmm. Orchestra teachers, I think, and I even think there's a little bit of research that Kristen Pellegrino uh, did that, that kind of shows that, you know, most string teachers keep playing. Yeah. They keep performing. We identify with our instrument. Um, a lot of us conduct, we, you know, we teach. And so there are a lot of, a lot of hats. I, I do like to think of us as hybrids. Yeah. And That's when people ask that question, you know, the pretty standard question about how do you identify? <laughs> they said, well, do you identify as a, a musician or a teacher? I just always kind of get confused. Yeah. Um, because I've, I'm one that's never been able to choose. Well, I mean, and that's what makes yes. you like one of the best is that you, you do it all and you don't just do it all halfway. You do it all really, really well. Um, and that, that says a lot. Um, about you and, <laughs> well I don't know and you you're you're being modest but obviously you know you've won like awards for your research you've you know your full professor um you've got a, a book a publication which um I can also uh you know share uh your website here in, in a second with our audience but um you know you have all these different things that you've done um that's quite remarkable thank you yeah so what are some of the, uh, I, what, I don't know if I can ask, uh, some of your research projects right now, some of the, some Ooh. of your, or your topics, at least your focuses, and you probably have uh -huh. a dozen, but maybe some of uh, the ones that you're most excited about or, uh, most okay, recent. You're going to talk research first. Um, actually the one I'm currently most excited about, I can't talk about yet. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. But I'm so excited about it. This though. will be a long podcast. I'll tell you about, about it next year. Uh, <laughs> cool. We'll have you back I on to talk about data it. Data collection. Um, but the, you know, I did do a study recently that I think has real significance for music teachers. Um, I did a, a 
experimental study, which isn't actually done very often mm -hmm. in music research, there's really hard to control variables. And this one was testing out the effect of edemotic earplugs. Oh, okay. You know about the edemotics, they're, they're passive high definition. Right. So um, you can still hear, this basically means you can still hear what's going on, but it reduces the SPLs to be at a safe level. Yeah, at a safe level, but also doesn't, not the way a foam your plug right. where, Mute it. you know, it's like now I can't hear and I feel like I can't adapt as a musician. Mm -hmm. And what we know from the research is that actually music, musicians are at pretty high risk for noise induced hearing loss. It's a real, Victim. yeah, it's a real Victim. occupational yeah. hazard and we don't talk about it enough in the profession. And even though things like the edemotic earplugs are very inexpensive, I think um, we actually sell them at our own university. We have something called a hearing conservation policy. Mm. That I think is uh, everyone should adopt this. When our music majors come in every single year, an audiologist comes in and tests their hearing. And we're constantly looking for whether or not they're experiencing. Uh, we also measure the sound levels in every rehearsal space, practice mm -hmm. rooms. Wow. Um, to see, you know, uh, how much are we overexposed yeah. to sound. And, and so they're getting data from each student uh, this year. Here's where you are. Next year, here's where you are. Here's where you're hearing yeah, is. Yeah, right. right. So um, I mean, and yeah. then in terms of the space, we're just double checking what our recommendations should be for safe mm -hmm. practicing to, because there's, you, you can tolerate uh, as any kind of person, um, some loud frequencies the issue becomes duration duration for sure uh the second thing is if it, the, if it's too high right out you can kind of kill the hair follicles and they don't recover uh yeah, people that's me don't really realize yeah that once you suffer um hearing damage it's it's something that's very difficult to correct mm -hmm. and so this study um that i did looked at why are all the reasons musicians don't wear earplugs because what we a lot of us know that we're supposed to wear them right we don't wear them because they feel funny or we're afraid we're not going to perform our best for a variety of reasons so i took one possible reason and that was just pitch oh yeah and it was me and uh david miller and john Geringer, and we set up an experiment and we tested people's pitch acuity or ability to really hear intonation yeah um using edemotics, using phone earplugs, and then not using any earplugs. And we found that uh, there was no difference mm -hmm. between using the edemotics and not using the edemotics and our ability okay. to- and the foam, uh, the foam was no good? Yeah, the foam, we did find a difference. Okay. There were some issues with the ability to perceive pitch in with some specific intervals and in the lower register. Oh, okay. I would have assumed the high register would be harder, but okay. Interesting. Yeah, I think it probably has to do with how much the earplug is just kind of cutting out volume across, you know, when we think about music, the human ear typically is hearing frequencies between 20 and 20,000 hertz. At birth. <laughs> yeah, at birth. Oh my <laughs> gosh, birth. what a good. At birth. Because it, <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't last long. No, it's stuck that you've got it. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I did a lot of, I, I read a lot of Geringer articles for my, uh, my dissertation and my research too for that. So, um, and then, uh, in my own, you know, personal struggle with hearing loss, uh, I actually didn't know that. So what do you have? I have, a, I have an 80 percent. I have a hearing of a 76 year old man. <gasps> I yeah. did not know yeah. that. Yeah. I have a hearing loss, uh, 80% over 3000 Hertz. So first eighty percent loss yeah. over three thousand hertz, which is a lot of music. That's a lot of music. Yeah. How do you navigate that? Um, you know, uh, the the trickiest part for me is triangle. Um, and some piccolo. You mean and some piccolo. Oh, triangle the instrument. Yeah. That yeah. Really ding, ding. Upper yeah. Register. Is it too loud? Too soft? I don't know. Yeah, I can't really hear it very well. Um, and so that's that's it is a challenge for me. You probably hear the fundamentals though really well. Oh yeah, and um, it's 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 kind of remarkable because like now I'm at the point where I can hear notes on a uh, string instrument and I can tell you what they are and I, it can go up pretty high even in here. But um, some of the really high notes are are a real struggle for me. Well, you would be losing the overtones. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But That's it's interesting because because uh, the students are being you know um, 
monitor now per year. When I was uh, before I started my teaching uh, training uh, during our sophomore year, we had to go for a hearing test and a speech test, and uh, I was not allowed in the, in the College of Education. I, I found out they would not let me in the College of Education because of my hearing, and so my, my professor called uh, Dr. Milton Butler. He saved me. I was a mess. I was a wreck because it's my dream. And he called, and they're like, okay, never mind. But they weren't going to let me in the College of Education. That was in 1994. Because of your hearing yes. loss. Mm -hmm. That's Yeah, so I suffered a lot of... Um, a so lot... here you are in the College of Music. Right. And we had to apply for the College of Education. During but the College of Education is the one deciding that this is a problem. Yeah. I can't quite even I, that was, And that was maybe old policy back in the you know early 90s. But it was crazy, and and so I was admitted, and so my professor had a call, and talked to the people higher ups, and they're like, okay, never mind. Unbelievable. I know it was unreal. Yeah, but I had a lot of uh, ear infections when I was younger. Yep. Um, a lot of swimming, a lot of ear infections, to the point where I could not walk. I had such bad ear, ear infections that I was dizzy, throwing up, and et cetera, et cetera. So I yeah. have a friend like that, and, and I, I don't know if I've really talked about this uh, publicly. So here we go. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's what it is. It's significant yeah. and perhaps even profound to think about it yeah. because, um, you know, you've complimented me, but here's this orchestra teacher who is, has beautiful <laughs> ensembles and you're very effective. And it gives us an example of the fact that we, we don't understand hearing loss. We don't understand yeah. um, the subculture of what it is to be deaf or how hearing loss impacts music participation because it actually doesn't impact it nearly as much as we think. Yeah. And you know, it, the hard part for me is um, background noise uh, and the kids who talk really soft, you know, those kids are like, are, are hard for me to like, I have to, like, you have to speak up. You have, you know, so. I can't hear them either. Yeah. <laughs> I, you yeah. know, um, yeah. and I, my hearing acuity is, is pretty, pretty strong. I mean, I, I have hearing loss as well because mm -hmm. we're aging. That's going to happen. Yeah. But even 10 years ago, I was on the other end of this because what we do know is that men also lose their hearing sooner than women, right? Um, particularly in the upper range. And so <laughs> I remember distinctly being in my parents' kitchen going, what is that? And nobody could hear it. And finally, my little sister came in and she's like, oh yeah, what's that? And it was that first, you know, right. now we think more of us know that, you know, the kids have those ringtones that they like to play for the teachers. Nobody over 40 can hear. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we didn't know about this stuff. No. I mean, do you know where your hearing loss came from? Just the ear infections? Where there's it, 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 it could have been that. It could have been music. It could have been headphones at the time that weren't, you know, monitored like they are on the iPhone where, you know, you can adjust yeah. the volume. Look, who knows? Yeah. And, and a lot of times it's, it's, it also can be hereditary. Um, it can be. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So I do know my that. Friend, my friend had a lot of um, ear infections growing up as well. And she has scar tissue on her eardrums, which mm. has, has big impact yeah. as well. Yeah. Mine so, is a high, higher range, um, and which yeah. is, which is more normal, I guess, uh, than anything else, but. Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And what we find in musicians more often than not is we develop a notch they call it a hearing notch where you lose the frequency range of like say 6,000 to 8,000. Oh, I don't, I don't think I have that. Mine's all high. high I have a high. notch. Oh, wow. Most musicians develop a notch. So is that, you think that might be from violin playing and is it in both ears or is it, I know a lot of violin players, it's like my left ear is. Those are right. all the amazing questions yeah. that we're yeah. still asking. And, yeah. you know, honestly, I'll be honest. I've only done one of, one of these studies. I mean, there's lots of people way more, uh, educated in this way and looking into that, but the last study I read not all, about, they're not all music teachers, and not necessarily, think from, that's from that right. perspective, they're looking at it from an audiologist perspective, you know, and that's you got that's it. good, but it's also doesn't doesn't help us as teachers. As much, yeah, we need to do more much. research in this area. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I agree. We that's need really to do cool. more, and we and we need to get people to protect their hearing. You know. Yeah. Um. But but I'm I'm as guilty as anyone else where I. Uh, you know, 
we all, you know, bring our public face out and I, I do my best to do my best. But the honest truth is like, I want every ounce of my hearing and capability to try to do my best. Like, I don't even think it's possible for me to listen hard enough. Do you know what I mean? I yeah, want every yeah, cell of my yeah, body yeah. <laughs> contributed to the task at hand. Um, and so it's, it, I do find myself having trouble. I don't wear earplugs like I should. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I need convinced that they're not going to inhibit my abilities. I think the only time I've worn earplugs in a performance was a 4th of July thing where the fireworks were going off like right above us. And it was really bad. So yeah, that 1812 overture, you know. <laughs> I've worn them once or twice yeah. uh, as well, but you're right. I barely wear them. But, you know, the Pittsburgh Symphony adopted Edomotics as their, I mean, oh. the musicians actually are wearing them. You're, we're finding it happen. People are starting to adopt them. So, so, you know, this is exactly what your podcast is on about. We started one conversation and it's cool though. I mean, this is what, this is where it goes, you know, and That's um, right. yeah. Yeah. So cool. Awesome. Very cool research and uh, look forward to finding out more about that, especially, yeah. especially now it's a personal, a personal connection to me. Yeah, so, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and I know that uh, you have, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the programs at your school? I know you offer like, you know, all of the degrees. Um, oh, my actual degrees. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you some things. Um, UNCG is a great school. It's University of North Carolina, Greensboro. We have a much larger school of music than anybody probably realizes. One of the largest in the Southeast. Uh, really comprehensive performance, mm -hmm. uh, music education. We have a new pop tech degree, which is taking oh. off like wild. I bet. We added a jazz music education line. So you can come to UNCG and, and you know, was the case for so many years that kind of if you weren't trained in a Western classical instrument and Western classical. Right. Um, methodology, that was it. You know, even if you came in as a jazz major, you were kind of converted into a classical studio in, in order to be a music major, but we've gotten rid of that. You can okay. come as jazz major, be jazz music education. We're working on the proposal to allow our pop tech students to also become music education majors. Very cool. Which is a, it's a, a different model. Yeah. And I'm proud of the changes that we're making um, to our curriculum. It's we <laughs> Most music education curriculums have, you know, what, 130, 140 credits. Um, we have, we, our state mandated that all undergraduate programs had to be 120 credits. Okay. And we had the opportunity to apply for a waiver, but our faculty, I mean, I have some amazing colleagues, Tammy Draves, uh, Connie McCoy, author of Culturally Responsive Teaching oh, and cool, Music cool. Education, okay. Jennifer Walter, Brett Nolker, Quentin Parker. And we talked about it a long time and we said, you know, we're concerned about our students' mental health yeah. and we're concerned about burnout and we're concerned about wellness and we don't want more than 120 credits because Good. for so many years, what we've done in teacher training is just kept adding. <laughs> they need this. They need that. They need this. And yeah. they do, right? Yeah. Well, we do, but. We do. Yeah, they do. We do. At the same time, I don't know. Let Luckily, they'll do it all. You can't do it all. Where did you learn how to be a teacher? Uh, in the classroom. After, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> after, I had, after I taught for five years, I think that's when I was like, you know what? I think I'm starting to get this. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to take our teaching. I don't want to undermine our teacher no. training program. But, but it is what it is. Like, but we learn to teach in the classroom with supports. Yeah. Um, I'm also a strong believer in the in a professional education program as opposed to. Um, other ways because you get, you are more prepared. That's what the research says. You're more yeah. prepared, but I'm also, and as an ASTA president, I'm also I was very next. open yeah. to the lateral entry model and alternative entry models are very valid, but we haven't figured out yet is how to make sure people who come in this, we just know this people who come in with alternative licensure and lateral entry tend to leave with much greater frequency. Uh, okay. That makes sense. Um, and, but we don't want that. No. So 
maybe yeah. there's another way we're looking into because we we also have a music teacher shortage right now. Right. We, we really need to invite everyone we can. Yeah. But back to our program, 120 credits, um, more flexibility. We're offering more room for electives within our program. Great. Which is shocking. Yeah. But when a student comes to UNCG, they can they could even focus if they wanted a little bit on participatory music making. Wow. We have an old time ensemble. Wow. That's we have cool. ukulele class, guitar. <laughs> I mean, you know. And one of the things I do at UNCG that I'll just add in there um, is my conductor identity. Sure. Was I have five identities that I like to trade through in my life. And, and one of them is conductor. And I, I work with our second orchestra, which is called the Symphonia. Mm-hmm. And it is uh, one of my joys. I, I, you know, we make music in so many different ways. And most recently uh, did a tango ensemble collaboration. Oh, God. Wow. Where I premiered a new composition with my orchestra with the tango ensemble. And um, we also then did a collaboration with a, um, I guess you would call them a, a folk band that kind of slants towards um, a mix of bluegrass, new grass styles. And mm-hmm. it's been really fun to explore. Yeah, that's really cool. Just Different, like just to, yeah. just to, yeah. Uh, branch out and do something really different that most people aren't doing. Yeah. Yeah. And with other expertise, because I don't have that expertise. Yeah. I mean, I I could try to teach tango and I, that would be okay. But having an actual tango violinist in there with my students, I mean, I picked up my violin too. And by the way, even though I embarrass myself right regular, I'll sit right in with my students. Like when I bring the jazz guys in, I'm not a jazz, but I, I'll do it. I do it with them. Yeah. And then that makes them less scared. Well, yeah, like, you have to. I mean, I think that's one of the great things about modeling. And and uh, we were yeah. just talking the last hour uh, with Adam is, you know, he's he's learning the instruments with his kids, but he's not afraid to make a mistake. And, and uh, you right. make a mistake with your kids. It's like, oh, a real person, you know? Yeah. 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 Yep. I'll improvise. I'll do whatever. That's great. Yeah, and I'll get better at it too. There you go. And so, the I guess the next big thing is uh, you're also asked to president, um, Mm -hmm. and you're in the middle of your term. (laughs) I am. Right. You're. Yeah. You've been you've been asked to president for a year now. I forget how the turnover works. Right. That's right. No, we did pass the one year mark. You're spot on. Yeah, because I just joined uh, the board uh, in last month, May. Yeah, that's right. Technically, spot on. I'm one year in. When you are asked to president, you um, commit for six years, two years as Mm president-elect, two as president, two as past president. Uh, American String Teachers Association is one of the most amazing organizations, associations, and and places where, for me, these are my best friends. Yeah. And people are passionate about the same thing. And just about, st- yeah, performing, playing, thinking. Yeah. It's so cool. So it's been amazing. I will confess, though, that stepping into the role in May May 15th, 2020. Oh, yeah. That was when I stepped into president-elect. And yeah. That's it, a rough time. To- it's been a lot of transition. And mm-hmm. it, Again, another thing to be proud of, though, I think our String Teacher Association weathered the storm. Um, Probably better than most. You yeah. got it. Yeah. We did. Yeah. We literally did. And it just speaks to the community. It speaks to the quality and commitment of string t- teachers mm-hmm. around the United yeah. States. Yeah. Yeah. It's been humbling and it's been humbling. Wow. Yeah. I just yeah. realized how much I mean that. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've learned a lot. I bet. I bet. Yeah. yeah that's a, a, a lot to go through, um, you know, with membership and people like, I know I was like, I'm going to quit teaching <laughs> all this. It was like, you know, it was just terrible. Um, so, uh, but yeah. Uh, and then where do you see, I mean, I know we're in a kind of a recovery path right now and that's what we have our, 
uh, board meetings in a, a few weeks here, yeah. uh, you know, and kind of a recovery. Um, but uh, ha- we have some really cool new things too, like the um, summer conference. Oh my gosh. Summer yes. Yeah. Hey, everybody listening. I know. Come to the summer conference. Yeah. <laughs> July sixteenth um, and seventeenth. Is that you right? You got it. Okay. The virtual virtual. Uh, spring teachers conference summit. I think. Yeah. Virtual spring teacher summit. Um. Yeah. Let me just say a few words about that. Sure. I mean, we're launching that this summer. It's the first time ever. And I'm going to pull up my do... web browser and uh, pull that up so people can people? see it. Yeah. While people well, are that's watching. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um. We're launching this program in in response to what members asked for. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we are the, okay. I'll just share with everyone who's listening. The most common complaint we get, um, at Asta is the cost of things. And we are really trying hard to work on that. We know it costs too much. Um, but we also know, I mean, until you're on the inside of it. And I was wrong. I was wrong on those days, by the way, it's July 17th and 18th, but go ahead. (laughs) I just agree with you. Uh, (laughs) Here's the reality: an organization or school, and any institution, costs money by its mere existence. You know, you keep mm-hmm. the lights running, you keep the thing moving. There's a staff, there's salaries involved, there's people to pay, um, and conference. Go up! Wow, you. <laughs> We are exploring some different models, mm-hmm. um, but conference contracts with hotels oh. generally span almost a five year in the future. And, you know, when you're when you're at the helm of it and I remember even sitting at, as president elect um, when it came to COVID, you know, can we just cancel this and get out of this hotel contract mm-hmm. and no one we'll have to pay a penalty? OK, well, finally, I remember just saying, like, what? what is the penalty? I mean, is it, is right. it 50,000? Is it, is it whatever? And I remember it was $500,000 penalty. If you cancel. Like you're bet. Yeah. You're better off holding the conference anyway and having zero people attend and taking that penalty and think about that penalty. That's, that's out of the pockets of your members. If you take it. That's crazy. And I know it frustrates people because they often say, why can't we just, you know, this, I get it because I, I had the same question. Yeah. Why can't we? Well, actually it would be irresponsible for me to make, make that decision on behalf of the members to do that. It's just too, the price tag's too big. Yeah. I don't mean to get us off in the weeds, but, um, no, it's exactly, that's, you're, you're right. So on. when you think about conference, it's like, how do we bring down costs and offer these amazing things because the amazing things do cost money. And mm-hmm. you don't realize it when you're sitting at a distance because most of us are operating within, you know, a school system yeah. or even a collegiate institution. So, so we are exploring just to reassure everyone, we, yeah. the board is deeply exploring different models and um, the conference contracts, we haven't entered into any new hotel contracts. Um, the ones we are, we were still committed to by the time I hit the board, we have two left, but after that, we haven't, so, we haven't, so we're, we we're, we're in for people. Louisville, at, uh, 24, yeah, we're doing Louisville and we do have to go back to Atlanta and I know people yeah, want yeah. us to go West. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> well, but you me. know, the truth is we need to explore going West. We need to yeah. explore being more equitable yeah. in terms of where we are. And yeah. wow. You asked me about the virtual conference and my response was this. We care about what our members think. We care about their feedback. Mm -hmm. Uh, I care deeply about it and we hear them. And one of the things they wanted was the virtual stream teacher summit because it's more accessible. Yeah. The cost is low. Yeah. There's no travel involved. I mean, right now it's a, what a hundred, it's a $115, $140 now uh, after May 1st here. Yeah. For a member and 310 for non-members. Should I tell you this secret? Yeah, read them all. Read them all really quick and then I'll tell you. Yeah, students can do uh, pay $45 and then uh, there's a student non-member rate for $125. So really, um, you know, if you're a member of ASTA, $140, uh, there's going to be a ton of amazing uh, sessions and you don't have to be there live. I'm guessing they're going to be recorded and and be able to access them for um, a certain amount of time after the event. Am I wrong? Right on You're 100 percent right. Okay. And, and that's actually the, the most beautiful part of it right. is the fact that not only will you have access to 
if you if you wanted to attend virtual live. Um, but you're going to have access for six months to more than 30 hours of professional yeah. development. And at the we're working on at the end of the um, recorded things, having certificates and things that you can use to submit to your school. Great. So you could be doing professional development for yeah. a huge. So yeah. here's the secret I'm going to tell. What? How much is the non-member? It's uh, yeah, uh, it's more expensive than joining AFTA. I, I, I already know your formula. <laughs> I'm right on there. You figured it's, it out. It's more exp expensive than joining AFTA and paying the member rate, right? Yeah. You got it. 310. And we did so, that on purpose. Yeah, smart. So we're hoping to pick up some members. Um, one of my my dreams for the American Strength Teachers Association is to open our doors wider um, to everyone, mm -hmm. but specifically to the secondary string teacher. Yeah. The, the person who uh, maybe initially identified as a band teacher. Mm -hmm. That's great. But you're a string teacher. We have many, many, many string teachers. I mean, yeah. you know, I think they're, we, we're we moving away from this language of non-string player. I remember thinking like, what the heck is a non-string player? That sounds so anti. Yeah. I, I try to say non-string major. I tried that too. And then yeah. I tried non-string primary. And then one of my dear friends um, and new uh, university string ed professor at the University of Kentucky. Okay. Name is David Miller. Amazing. I don't know David. I need to meet David. Oh, wait, you meet him. You're going to meet him tomorrow, today. Oh, great. Amazing string teacher. And uh, he said to me, I think you need to call us string secondaries. I do play the violin. It's not my native. Uh -huh. and, he, and, he, and he's right because I started thinking, gosh, what if somebody called me a non-singer? Right. Like I didn't major, but we don't go around going, Hey, you non brass player. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're a non flute player. That's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so That's I pretty funny. Thinking, yeah. Good point. But the point. string community is like you non string player. So well, we, um, we, we're a little bit, you know, a little uppity, yeah. maybe, maybe just a little but bit. But I don't think we're that as well, we are, and but yeah. we aren't. Yeah. And I think we've moved away from that, but we just don't even realize because it's been part of the, terminology for so long. So yeah. I'm, I'm referring to people now as string secondaries by their request. String and secondary. Yeah. String like secondary because I'm a, I'm a base secondary. Yeah. You know, I'm never going to be a base primary. I'm a yeah. violinist, but um, my base skills kind of, well, maybe I shouldn't say that out loud because somebody could call me on it. Like, okay, play this. The base, bass, yeah. The right? bass player is going to call you out big time. I'll try though. Hey, look, I can do a revenge of the double bass. So we're going to do a challenge on the next episode with Rebecca oh, playing bass. <laughs> bass players are going to be able to call in and upload excerpts for her to play. She'll just gonna... excerpts. No, 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 no. We're going to stick with. Uh, I can do the first George Vance book. Yeah. Oh, look, wow. bass players, you're impressed. Nice. I know who George yeah, Vance is. Yeah, those are those are some good. I can good do tunes. some some mandel exercises. You go. Um, but don't ask me to do the Dragonetti. I'm out. Yeah, no. Yeah, that, <laughs> that that first that opening lick I can't get. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. out. I can play the Revenge of the Double Bass though. I right. Great tune. Great tune. That's awesome. God, I hope That's the awesome. bass players are laughing. They are probably oh, laughing. Okay. I, I I'm laughing, but <laughs> okay. it's awesome. Well, very cool. And then, uh, but I, I know that you have a, a lot on your plate today with uh, AFTA meeting, and you've already had 800 meetings this morning and research. Oh, I have to things. talk about one more thing. I'll pick it. Can I pick it? Sure. Okay. I listen. was going to say your book, but. Um, oh, I mean, I, yeah, I'll, I hope I'll, everybody, I'll, you know, I'll, humility, just, I'll just mention it. How about I do a tw five do second it. thing? Uh, Rebecca's book, Teaching Strings in Today's Classroom. I have the, the screenshot up here. Um, if you go to teachingstrings.online, it's actually a website, dot online. Um, you'll be able to see some of the um, videos and lessons and tutorials from her book and uh, find out how to get it and all that good stuff. But um, it's it's definitely it's on my um, recommended books to get um, on my on my website. So definitely want to check it out. OK, that's my that's my two seconds. Now, what's your what's your topic? That was so kind. And I uh, I'm in the middle of updating the website, um, okay. which the current website is unaffected. So go for it. people. Yeah. Um, but it will be updated because I also have a YouTube channel that has some really nifty stuff that teachers can actually use in the classroom. Very cool. But I haven't integrated it with the book because that all happened during COVID. Yeah. Um, but there's some cool play along tracks. And the most important thing on my YouTube channel 
is, and it also goes after that tagline, teaching strings in today's classroom. And what, are, what these, is your YouTube channel? Teaching strings in today's classroom. Okay. I hope that's, you can find I'm, it. I'm going though. to search for it right now. I want to pull it up. Okay. I'm, I Maybe you'll give me a I tutorial later on how to even. I found it. Create usable oh, things. And, hold on. That's the book. That's a book ad. You got an ad for your book that just pulled up, which is. I'm, I'm doing it on a different screen here, but yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay. You'll find it. You just, you just keep going. What's on it. Um, I work at a, a minority serving institution, uh, UNC Greensboro and uh, our school of music is becoming more, more, more diverse. That's something I care about a lot is increasing diversity in the workforce, D music teaching, string teaching specifically, because, mm -hmm. and you also have all figured out, I love research from the research. We know that 90% of all string teachers are white, but our students based on the research are actually way more diverse than that. So mm -hmm. how do we kind of move forward? Um, and the, what my undergraduates did where they won a grant and they created a series of videos so that there would be representation cool. of younger teachers of a variety of backgrounds and nice. uh, that you can use with your students, which is really lovely. We've had such a positive response from young kids when they see these beautiful 20 to 22 year old <laughs> these lessons. Yep. Um, so uh, yeah, I invite people to look at that and that relates really strongly to the, my, my next passion, which is community engaged work. Mm -hmm. I really, so one thing that people don't know about me is that I grew up in a very rural part of Pennsylvania. Um, that was, that is really economically depressed. Okay. And I went to a title one school wow. and my title one school did not have an orchestra program, um, wow. which leads you to be like, how did you start playing the violin, Rebecca? Well, right. yeah, I was really lucky when I was six years old, my, um, a Suzuki teacher moved to town and my parents said, do you, I mean, I didn't know any better. Six years old, you want to play the violin? Sure. Yep. And I played the violin uh, for until I turned 11 and, and I was in, you know, like Suzuki book four and my teacher moved and that left me with no yeah. access. Yeah. Oh, wow. And so, you know, I joined band oh, as a band. Kid. I did not know that. Okay. Mm. I started on flute, which by the way, so I asked you were secondary, secondary flute. I'm a secondary flute player. I asked to play the saxophone yeah. and my father brought home a flute from the parent meeting and said, flute is, is good for a girl. Oh. I love my dad. I love my dad so much, but yeah. I ended up playing the flute and it really, I didn't identify with it so much. Yeah. Um, and then in ninth grade, I got tired in marching band. I'm not being able to hear myself. So I switched to the trumpet. Oh, wow. I hope there's some string secondaries in here who play trumpet. <laughs> there's, there's probably some that listen. That Relating strongly. Yes. So, um, so yeah, I was a band kid. I was a choir kid and I just kind of happened to have this like violin on the side. And then eventually a little bit close to closer to time for Kai found a teacher. And, and that's a little bit of another story. I don't sure. need to go on too long about it. But the point is I was behind. And I also just wanted access, you know, yeah. I just, it just really spoke to me. And one day I was in line as I was preparing my college auditions on the violin with one of my friends and I was going on about, oh, I, you know, and how am I going to do this? Cause I didn't have this and what was me? I didn't have that. And she, she just looked at me and she said, at least you had a chance. Yeah. Because, you know, my parents had paid for those lessons and right. she had grown up with a single mom and she just, that wasn't even a conversation. Yeah. She literally never had a chance to study music and she was quite gifted, I think, wow. as a musician. Yeah, I was pretty fortunate in my county. We were the only uh, city in, in Northeast Ohio in my county. We were the only one in my city or in my county to have orchestra. And so had we not had that, I had that opportunity and that access, I don't know what I'd be doing today because that's the only thing that that's what saved me growing up. That's what saved me in high school. And my high school orchestra teacher was the person who was there and uh, my friends from orchestra and orchestra. Yeah. That's it. I mean, it just means so much. Mm -hmm. So my big passion has been increasing access. So That's I run awesome. two, two community partnerships. Cool. Um, 
I apply for, they're not, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out a sustainability funding model, but um, I get grants, donations, whatever every year. We serve about uh, 80 kids in two title one elementary schools. Um, cool. And then, but the real baby is um, this Saturday program that I started in 2014. And I want everybody to do this program because what it is, is just older kids teaching younger kids. It's a near peer model. Mm -hmm. It brings the, the private lesson costs down to a fraction. Right. Um, I do run it off some grants because I do pay my undergraduate students to teach in the program. Mm -hmm. What it's done is created a very diverse community of string yeah. players. We meet from nine to noon and everybody gets an instrument and everybody gets private lessons. Wow. Everybody plays a solo recital. And I've had three students now from the program be admitted to music programs. That's great. They're all people who um, can absolutely cannot afford yeah. to pay for the private lessons. Um, and that's I just cool. love it. Yeah. I love it the most. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. that's a great feeling. And um, just giving that those those kids the opportunity to have strings in their life and maybe discover something. And then something they return they the opportunity. Yeah. yeah. They're literally giving others the opportunity within yeah. that model, which is just... That's beautiful really cool. and i i always wondered like is this effective or do we need a master master teacher yeah and you, and it's so, not like a string project where you have that it's a lot different than a string project it's actually a lot different it's a private lesson yeah, yeah. group lesson model i mean the undergrads are getting experience teaching i mean i do sort of have a a master teacher in terms of one of my graduate students i mean okay so it was heather loftall yeah. who now is going to be the new Yay. string education professor at Ohio State University. And she I have to do it, was 100% a master teacher. Yeah. And all my undergrads got to yeah. watch her teach. And the thing about her as a master teacher is she's a master teacher in both the private lesson and mm. the ensemble space. So that just, you know, wow. Heather's violinist? Violist. Violist. I did not know her principal. Yeah. Very cool. Quite a fine viola player. That's cool. Yeah. Very nice. Well, and I'm I'm excited for Ohio State to, you know, have uh, someone like her. And uh, yeah, I'm so glad that they are. A lot of people. I mean, Bob Gillespie actually retired a couple of years ago. Yeah. So they've gone a few like this... years now without a string education professor, and a lot of people didn't realize that. Yeah. So, a I'm so thrilled for Heather. I'm thrilled for Ohio state, yeah. but I'm really, really thrilled that that position, which is kind of iconic, right? Yeah. I mean, Bob Gillespie's iconic, right? The institution and that position and, and that place for the training of yes. string teachers is kind of a, a pillar. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really thrilled for yeah. Ohio. It's big, big, big job, but uh, she's going to do great there. Yeah. I'm really excited um, for her. And we need universities that are training string teachers. Yes. We need them because there are, have you, do you have a lot of string positions available right now in Georgia? We don't have any now, but we did uh, when, the, when it was hot, you know, not in April when people were announcing retirement. Oh, so you've already, yeah. They, they filled them and, and they, they fill up pretty quick here. I mean, it's pretty attractive area to be in. And uh, we, we do have a lot of people. Yeah. String teachers listening to the podcast. If you're interested in moving to North Carolina, please message me. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, we have some really, really fine string programs that are, have opened up and oh, uh, there are not going to be enough candidates. Nice. Okay. Well, that's not nice, but it's good for the people that are looking for a job. It's good yeah. for people that are looking for really, yeah. you know, and that's a wide variety of positions that are open, but th we're finding that's happening across the country. And, so, and the other question is, if they come and they have a bachelor's degree, do you have a program that caters to the working string teacher for a master's degree with you? You you must know that we do, which is why you're See? Well, I, I actually I, I actually I didn't. Oh, but, you um, didn't? I didn't. But I, I figured yeah. like if I was a young string teacher and I needed a job and I wanted to study I with one of the best in the in the country, like where could I go? Boom, boom, I get I get a job and uh, a master's degree, you know, at, with you. All right. The truth of the matter is we actually have an online master's degree that's been voted by multiple sources as number one for 
quality and value in nice. the United States Very and it's, cool. it's online. So it doesn't matter if you're coming to North Carolina, right? You can get well, your master's yeah. at UNCG and work with Tammy Draves, Connie McCoy, Rebecca McLeod, Jennifer Walter, Quentin Parker, Brett Nolker. It's a pretty good lineup. Yeah. Um, and uh, you, it's is got it, a lot is of it, Is it uh, asynchronous or is it asynchronous? It's asynchronous. So you've already got like things recorded, lectures and materials and... You're 100% right. I, yeah. It launched today. My, my course launched today. Oh, cool. Yeah. But just so everybody knows, my course is the Research Foundations course. That's great. Well, I've been thinking about what pedagogy looks like online and I haven't quite solved that one yet. I'm yeah. still mulling it over. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it's great if, if that's your option. Uh, I am a huge fan of face to face just because, you know. Me too. <laughs> yeah, it's just it, it's that personal connection, and uh, for me, it, it works better. But not. It, I will say I agree with you one hundred percent. And of course, we have both um, a master's and PhD in person program. It's a very yeah. different experience. Sure. So if you want to stay teaching and get a master's, the online experience is actually really, really flexible, which is lovely in its one way. Uh, in-person training is lovely in a different way. Yeah. And also, if you come in person as a string person, you have the opportunity to work in that community partnership yeah. I described, which really, right. and also work with my symphonia. I mean, it's just like. You have I, assistantships and yeah, available. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just a few. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I, they're very hands-on, which is a little atypical. A lot of times people don't know. I mean, I know that you, this will really resonate with you is that I don't know about you. I, I don't know why I think this resonates with you. Let me try this again. <laughs> I went back thinking, oh, I want to get my master's so I can be a better teacher. And then I started doing my master's and I was like, oh, wait, this is all about research. Yeah. Now I'm confused. Um, and then I ended up loving research, but I wanted to be a better teacher yeah. and I wanted to be a better musician. Um, and I, I actually got all those opportunities when I went to Florida state sure. it was yeah. laid out brilliantly for that. But I keep that in the forefront of my mind when somebody comes in as a graduate student and I definitely ask them first, like, why, why, you know, yeah. what are you interested in? But I would say nine out of 10 times, people want to be a better teacher. They want to know more about pedagogy and they want to know more about conducting. And we do have those opportunities in person. Yeah. When you come to UNCG, we have a really nice blend. Um, That's great. So that's not, and well, I love know, research. But the, but the thing research. is like when you're teaching a research class to a bunch of music ed people who um, are in the classroom or we're in the classroom or we'll go back to the classroom and you've been in the classroom, you under, you have that that relation that you understand you can relate it to them and what their background has been um, where there's some professors out there that have spent a year or two in the classroom and really um, don't relate it that way anymore. And that's the big, well, I think that's one of the big differences. Let's be 100% fair. You forget when you're out of the classroom mm -hmm. and also the world changes. Right. And, you know, I, I worry about ivory tower, but you know, that's why I, and in the classroom. And that's why sometimes on the airplane, right back to one of the first conversations we have, you know, what do you do? Oh yeah. I teach little kids because, <laughs> you know, and I, I'm not a eight hour a day public school teacher anymore. Yeah. So I, people that do that are am amazing, but I am in the classroom multiple times a week and it's a real public school. Yeah. My Saturday program is a Saturday program. It's totally elective and it's going to yeah. function differently by design. Right. We're, we, we are specials teachers. We're integrated. My partnership, it's not after school, which is mm -hmm. what delineates it from a string project. It's, it's an elective for the elementary kids during the school day. So we are beholden to every single policy set by the state of North Carolina. We have to interact with the <laughs> teachers and the policies of the school and the yeah. administration. Yeah. And it keeps me really much more honest. Right. Um, yeah, because you're right. I mean, I think everybody that's listening can ha can relate to a professor that they had in college that has no clue because it had been 20 years yeah. since the last time they were even in a classroom, like doing anything real, you know. Um, yeah, you forget that the kids are going to throw up in the middle of the room. Yeah. yeah. And it's not just about how in tune their first finger is. Like yeah. this kid just came in and, yeah. you know, flipped out and. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
it's it's reality and <laughs> ran away it, down the hall and you're right people lose touch of that so um that's great yeah, yeah you're yeah. so you're so relevant in yeah. in what you do and um that's awesome yeah. that's awesome awesome yeah well, hey, uh, I know I, I know you have uh, some preparation to do for uh, an upcoming be- newbies board member that I'll be in at three o'clock. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for uh, being on the on the show and sharing everything. And you're just amazing. And I'm I'm looking forward to uh, uh, spending some time with the board with you and everybody else. And uh, but thank you again for being here. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, you're awesome. Uh, but everyone else, uh, this is the last for this week. Uh, I have some uh, coming up next week, some really cool guests, but I'll be putting up some uh, trailers uh, this weekend for that. Uh, without further ado, this is it. Orchestra Teacher Podcast, out. Thank you for tuning in. For resources and more information, visit orchestrateacher.net.